Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you to TASA, um, whom my office has had the pleasure of working with for the last couple of years, and I'll get into that a little bit. But thank you to the President, um, Conference Program Chair, and Jean Dan for being so kind to me. Um, my name is Frances Colon. I am the Deputy Science Advisor for the Secretary of State. That means I live here in Washington, D.C., and I work on science policy issues. How many scientists in the room? Okay, so I'm a recovering neurobiologist. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I say recovering because I've spent the last eight years working on international policy issues for the State Department, specifically in science. Um, but in 2004, I graduated with a developmental neurobiology degree from Brandeis University. You know where that is? Massachusetts. A big neurobiology program. And I killed <coughs> rats every Wednesday for seven years. <laughs> and I did developmental studies on embryos, okay? And I was in the lab and I, all that time, I felt I was very drawn to community issues. I wanted to make things better for girls, so I became a mentor for a summer program for Latina students. So I should say I'm from Puerto Rico, which makes me part of the Hispanic women's population of the United States. And I got involved with the community doing those programs. I sat on boards of schools in the inner city, and I got involved in festivals to put together music from my community to bring that to the very cold city of Boston. Um, I had a penchant for community advocacy. And so I decided to use my scientific degree to move on into the science policy advocacy space. And so that's how I ended up in DC and working for the State Department. Um, this job is my third incarnation at the department, um, and it's maybe one of the most fun. Um, I did get to do my comfort zone for the last four years before this. I did Latin America, Caribbean, so that's easy. I just speak Spanish. Hi, como estas? Kisses, kisses. Hi, everybody. How are you? And it was, you know, it's the face of America. It looks like me, which is great. So now I get to have global purview, and I get to talk to you. Because the issues that we're talking about are universal, right? Um, the US has made tremendous progress on women in science, but guess what? We're still not very good at it, OK? And so I guess what I want to talk to you about today is an initiative that we really love in my office, um, which is around science diasporas. It's called the Networks of Diasporas in Engineering and Science, or NODES. And we love acronyms in Washington, <laughs> N-O-D-E-S. And so we created that initiative because we saw that there was an opportunity. So as you know, we've had tremendous problems with money in Congress. And, and so one of the ways that you get around those things is you become very creative about using the tools that you have. And what do we have? We have a very talented scientific and engineering community in the US. And a good percentage of that community is diaspora from all over the world. And if you want to get at some of the um, global challenges, technological challenges in countries around the world, you want to apply the best and brightest minds to those problems. And some of the best and brightest minds that can solve the problems in our countries and regions of origin are the very diaspora that come here to study or work. They have expansive academic and business networks, okay, and are eager many times to help their countries and regions of origin more than anybody else know the countries and regions of origin better than all of the USAID could possibly ever dream of. And so the impetus behind this thing was to try to bring the science diaspora together, um, find where those champions were. The job with TASA was completely already done, but TASA became a very important model for us in getting other diasporas to gear up, okay? so. I can tell you how many times we've had TASA on panels um, incentivizing other diasporas to get their act together around this very idea. I can tell you that we've actually been, I'm supposed to move this so I can tell you. Okay, here we go. Okay, so told you about notes. The partnership involves the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academies of Science, and the Department of State. Okay, so it's public, semi-autonomous, um, governmental, <coughs> and um, think tanks, sort of private. Um, and I'll tell you why this is important. I'm not going to go through the list. I don't want to bore you. Um, but I want to tell you that TASA has been an amazing model 
And in the last two years since we launched Nodes, where we've pushed the TASA model for other diasporas to kind of get a sense of what's possible and what they can do, we've actually seen two countries launch dia science diaspora networks. And even more important, which is where you want to get, have those diaspora networks in the US influence policy back home, which is where you want to be. <coughs> Colombia is a signature case. Um, Colombia had a lot of diaspora at Purdue University. One of those diaspora um, decided to launch the um, Columbia, a university in Colombia, Columbia University and Purdue network. This network has expanded so much that it began to influence sort of the, the poli scientific policies in Colombia. And since the launch of nodes, where we said, this is good, you really have to you know, take this further, they have um, this week. Um, so in December, they launched their first science diaspora conference without any influence from us, invited us to see and participate, which is amazing. This is exactly what you want to do. You want to think of these things and then say, take it and run with it. If you can do this, we'll support you. And they did. They brought together their entire scientific diaspora community in the U.S. in Boston. And last week, launched their first um, public policy incentive program for bringing back some of the scientific diaspora to take positions in their academic institutions, et cetera. None of that to say, <coughs> none of that to say that bringing back diaspora is the point of any of this. I very much believe that at the heart of using your diaspora is brain circulation, being able to have strong networks at home, that connect with the networks abroad, wherever those may be, not just in the US, that if, that if you have strong policies to bring back, that's great, but that those networks thrive and are able to do things virtually. Because today, with the speed of communication, with virtual access and connections, you can have students coming back and forth, you can have classes taught virtually, and the endless realm of possibilities <clears throat> for dias scientific diasporas is out there to be able to help make things a little bit better. So what I'm showing you is actually if Facebook plots their connections of all of their users, this is what it looks like. This is what scientific collaborations from 2005 to 2009 around the world look like. And I wanted to show that to see, so that you can actually make that connection between connections between people around the world, a globalized economy with very little barriers to communication, and what scientific collaborations around the world are doing and how they're very, very similar and very much along the same vein. The global diaspora, this was an article published in Nature, which many of you read, one of mine. Um, this is basically a mapping of the percentage of researchers in foreign countries and how they flow. All of this to say, that we have a lot of our talent all over the world flowing back and forth. And on our panel, you're going to hear um, from a, one of the examples that we tell all the time um, of a woman who was in the United States, part of your Turkish diaspora, went back and is leading one of your academic institutions. And she is one of those examples, a prime example of a woman diaspora who is actually making this model work. Okay? Another interesting tidbit of data is that the young and the restless are something we need to be aware of. In scientific diaspora, foreign postdocs outnumber <coughs> foreign professors around the world. Okay? And so you have a very young, talented population that's eager to move around and represents you. And some of the reasons that they have um, come up with when surveyed as to why they migrate back and forth, what makes people move around improved quality of life, more research funding, better salaries, and a desire to experience another culture. Some of the barriers to migration that these uh, postdocs and foreign researchers have um, brought up are language barriers, visa obstacles, and political systems that may restrict any type of freedom. <coughs> In the short term, what a scientific diaspora needs 
is individual champions. Some of the groups are TASA-like and are very organized and have annual conferences. Some of the groups are three people around the living room, but that's okay, okay? You are their model and we are trying to incentivize them to follow <coughs> the same model. Those are the champions and those are the ones that need our support and need to see how you've made your system work. In the midterm, you need to have success stories. People need to see that it works in order for them to get excited and go after it. And in the long term, what science diaspora has need the most <coughs> for it to be sustainable and really work and really influence policy and for it to make a real difference is institutions in their home or region of origin need to have bought in to their value, okay? So, how much time do I have? Perfect. Um, women are beneficiaries of this diaspora talent. They are part of this diaspora talent, and they are part of this um, population that we cannot leave behind, wherever they are in the world or whether they are at home. Um, we have learned a lot of lessons from trying to advance women in science in the United States, and I think you're probably going to address some of those from the perspective of the National Science Foundation, which has done a lot, but many programs in place that we're still learning from. There is a lot that we still need to do, um, but I am really heartened. I speak on women in science and STEM issues all the time. I speak um, from the perspective of a woman science leader in my government, but also from a woman Hispanic leader in my community who is in a STEM field. And here in the U.S., having a woman with a Ph.D. who is a Hispanic and representing her community is very much, let's say, a rarity, okay? It's not very common. Um, so I honor my community and what I do, but I also honor my country and what I do. And I recently went to Arizona because Intel, the computer company, brought me there to speak to a room like this full of middle school girls. And I spoke about my story and how I came from Puerto Rico and it was really warm and the beaches are really beautiful. And I went to Boston and it was snowing and they towed my car the first week that I was there because it was a snowstorm. <laughs> and I had no idea you can't park on the street when there's a snowstorm. All of that to say that many years later, all my sacrifice paid off to bringing me to a point where I could use my science for the benefit of my people, the American people, women, diasporas, and my Hispanic community, which is, I'm sure, very much what you do for your community. Um, when I exited the room, there was a little girl, how old? let's say she was about 12 years old. She was crying, and I, her guidance counselor from her school approached me and said, may I speak to you? My student would really like to meet you. And she was sobbing, so I went over there, I had no idea why she was sobbing, and I said, Hi, como estas? Nice to meet you. Um, what's going on? Did you like to talk? You know, and she said, I loved your talk. I have always thought that I wanted to be a computer scientist. I want to code. I want to learn how to code. And I have no idea how to do that. I have no idea who to go to. I have no idea who to talk to. You're the first scientist that looks like me that I've seen in my life. Tell me what to do. And that right there is, it makes your day, it makes your year. Um, of course, I, I knew exactly what to tell her to do. There's girls who code. There are so many programs. They travel around the country. There was Intel has programs. And her guidance counselor just needed the name of a program and how for her to apply. Um, it made my day. That's why I do what I do. I'm sure that's why you do what you do, to mobilize these communities and to bring those resources to your community. So thank you for having me. Thank you for having this panel. Thank you for doing what you're doing for your girls and your women. It's very important, and it makes all the difference, and we're here to partner with you. Thank you.